Let me uh, start by saying uh, thank you, um, do a little introduction. My name is Ryan Pratt. I've got with me Justin Flood and uh, Mike Vanderplume. We're all from a company called uh, Peak Six Investments. I'm the CTO of that firm and they're both uh, senior developers within uh, the capital management business, which is part of uh, uh, the proprietary trading business that's part of that business. Um, we are here today to give a presentation in particular around a system that we built over the last several years that deals with high, la or high bandwidth data and uh, low latency systems. Um, some of those lat latency systems we've written in, in Java, some we've written in C. We're gonna go through the various areas where we picked and why we picked those things. Um, and as you can see, we, we have sort of a parenthetical renaming of our talk, which is drinking from the fire hose without losing a drop which is maybe a better uh, explanation of what the problem is that we're gonna walk through. Um, let me set the stage to begin with. Uh, when we first started uh, dealing with uh, or finding out about the problem that we ended up uh, building all these systems around, it was around late 2013 and uh, we realized we had spent the last several years building up uh, a, a new framework for how our overall trading system worked. We'd made a lot of use of Java, and along the way, one of the things we built was a new feed dissemination system. Um, feed de dissemination being so all this market data that we are listening to and using as part of our business, and we have a bunch of systems that need to get at that data and do various things with it, and we wrote some stuff that would parse it and, and hand it uh, out to all the systems that needed to use it. We had not correctly anticipated some of the changes that were gonna happen with the markets, though. And in particular, one of the things we had decided from a design perspective was to disseminate the, the, the data using uh, TCP, which, had its benefits, we needed reliable delivery of this stuff, and uh, we wanted to try to keep things as simple as possible. <laughs> and we had in previous iterations of building things used multicast and tried to use various things for reliable multicast and had run into a bunch of problems. So we got very clever and we made something that conflated and compressed and did all this fancy stuff and we thought that we would be able to manage the amount of data on our network by, uh, while still being able to use TCP. Well, 2013 came along and things really started changing. They'd already been a little bit on a, on a move in the previous years, but uh, it, they, they started sort of ramping up in 2013. And the big thing that was happening were the options markets were fragmenting, and it really wasn't just the options market, but for peak six, that's where primarily we focus. And by fragmenting, what I mean is there was a lot of new exchanges coming online. Uh, when you go back to 2008, there were seven-ish exchanges, uh, and although one came out on that year. Um, and by today, there are 14 going on 16 by the end of this year, options exchanges. And what matters around that is that every time you have a new exchange come online, the only thing you're sure of is that the amount of data you're going to handle is going to go up. You know, roughly you could say double. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that. And, and it doesn't mean that there's necessarily more opportunity from a trading volume perspective because really all you're knowing is there's another place where there are orders and quotes for the, for the uh, instruments for which you might be uh, trying to do trading activity on. But while there can be more quotes for those things, it's not necessarily uh, going to cause any more actual trading activity. And so every time you bring a new exchange online, the one guarantee you have is that there's more complexity in the systems you have to build, and there's going to be a lot more data. Well, for, for, from 2008 to now, to have it go from seven exchanges to close on 16 exchanges, the amount of data we had to handle went crazy. Uh, to give you a view on options markets, options markets are uh, just quickly going over it. Uh, at U.S. equity options are derivative products uh, where uh, the, the, the asset they're a derivative of is equity. So you would be familiar with this as stocks, public, public stocks that trade on the stock exchanges. But for every one equity that might be trading and quoting on one of the stock exchanges, there can be up to thou you know, several thousand individual instruments that are derivative products against that equity. And so while there's a lot of data within the equity markets, the amount of data that's just, that's pumped out from a quoting perspective from the options markets is orders of magnitude larger. 
uh, to the, up to the point, uh, I mean, it's within the gigabits per second of data that these, all of the exchanges pump out. And if you're building sy systems that need to deal with it, you have to somehow be able to keep up with it, which is where we say, where I, why I say it's like drinking from the fire hose. Um, to give you a sense, in 20, 2013, the beginning of the year, we were underway with building a bunch of stuff for our, for, our, for our business, and we had things more or less working pretty well. And by the end of the year, while we had successfully produced a bunch of, um, a bunch of uh, new software that was both architectural infrastructure as well as um, new actual uh, uh, strategies for the, for the business, we also found ourselves a little bit in this crisis mode where things that had been working were no longer working. And I've got, I've got a couple graphics that, you know, as they say, pictures are worth a thousand words that kind of talk through it. This is maybe how we felt at the beginning of, of 2013. And, and frankly, we were maybe not quite so sure that we were getting that full, but we were handling it. We had a big amount of data coming out of the options markets, but our systems were able to take it and were able to more or less manage it. And by systems, I mean both our software and our hardware. We were, you know, turning along, feeling really good about things, building new, new strategies, and mid-year, all of a sudden, it started to go like this, where it was a lot more than any of our, our systems, both hardware and software, were really able to fully manage, especially within the spikes. And we started seeing our 20 gig capacity network start dropping packets, you know, as, especially at the open and at other peaks within the market day where the, the, we were trying to push more than 20 gigs of data through our routers and they were just dropping packets left and right. And by the end of the year, we ended up in a situation that uh, this short little video is probably best representative of. Oh, Joe Miller, you just found the marble in the oatmeal. You're a lucky, lucky, lucky little boy because you know why? You get to drink from the fire So yeah, it was, it was a little rough. And, 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 and the stuff that we were writing that, had, that was basically that was fairly representative of how things were starting to go, it was the core of our business. It was our ability to succeed and manage both capturing, finding and capturing opportunity on the markets, but also manage the risk we have at play required that we really be able to keep up with this fire, this fire hose of data. Otherwise, you just don't know what's going on. And you don't know what risk you're at. So, we had to come up with a way to solve the problem. So let me take a step back, quickly talk about what Peak 6 is. So that's the trading floor. This is our office. We have a bunch of software that we've written and uh, a bunch of uh, uh, various systems we've put in place that are our way of creating um, uh, uh, this, really the backing infrastructure for all of the traders on the floor here to be able to implement their strategies and manage the risk around them. Uh, across the U.S. equity options markets. Peak6 is a, what would be called a proprietary trading firm, and just to, like, what does that mean? I know a lot of people have heard this and don't always know what that means. It really just means Peak6 is a private, it's a company that takes com the, the capital that is from within the company, so it's no outside customers or, or, or anything like that. Take that capital, use our own strat proprietary strategies and proprietary software to try to trade on the market and hopefully make that capital grow and not shrink. Uh, Doing that year after year is a relatively difficult thing. There's a lot of competition in the market, and the technical challenges, especially when you try to do it at scale, um, are, very, are, are very broad and very difficult. And in particular, peak six, our strategy is about breadth. It's about being across the market, being able to trade and be in most of the things that are out there as far as liquid equity options, which means we actually care about not a niche of that fire hose of data, we care about all of it. To, to, to further kind of make our problem hard, in the years leading up, the few years leading up to 2013 when we started running into this uh, sort of overcapacity issue with our networks, we had re-architected all of our systems so that most of our stuff was uh, um, distributed, service-oriented, and a lot of it written in Java because Java was, a, frankly, an easy, great ecosystem to do a lot of this in. That said, um, as we started falling over and getting behind on data, it was exacerbating 
what had been a small problem at the beginning of the year around areas where we needed low latency to be in place, and in particular, just some uh, stability to be in place. And as things got much, much worse than what we had planned on, we started hitting big GCs. We, we built a bunch of stuff in a garbage collected uh, a language that has a GC, and, and we had built stuff in a way where we thought we were managing the rate of uh, garbage creation that was going to work, and then we found out we were way off on what we were going to need to be able to handle. Um, and, the, and, and, and the problem with that is, is that we had spent years building this, and now we had, a, had to figure out how to both fi fix our infrastructure from a feed management perspective, but not have to go redo everything. It was important that Java still work for us. And then to kind of throw in a final, a final part of the problem was, at that same moment, we had a bunch of new opportunities showing up in the marketplace that for which the solution was basically creating a bunch of more downstream client systems. And by downstream, I mean you've got your fire hose of data coming in from the market, and you've got some internal management uh, way of disseminating, which at the time was TCP. And we needed to, more or less, you could say, double the number of systems that were going to be listening to that streams of data. So if we're only already knocking our routers over with listening to the data on you know, however many systems we had, going to twice that was going to definitely not work. So I can say it, we, we knew we had a problem, we had to fix it, and we really knew just three things about it. We didn't exactly know how we were going to do everything, but we did know there were three things that were at play. One, TCP had to go. We had to somehow figure out how do we go back to using multicast in a reliable way without hitting all the problems we had before because TCP was not going to scale for us. We were killing things, killing our systems, killing our, our, our network with this. And so that's for sure all we knew. Number two, we knew that Java had to be a part of our platform. We had to figure out how do we make it so that we can stay within this ecosystem, scale it out, manage the various different types of needs across all the systems we had, both where there was true, very low latency, and, and if you are in Peter's talk before this, you, you, low latency means a bunch of things, but in, in our scenario, there were some systems that we needed to be sub-million, a very small number, consistently sub-million. There was a few more that we needed consistently to be in single-digit millisecond management on, and again, consistent. So every time, no matter what, all day long, we can count on end-to-end -end this thing from there to there, was going to be one you know, single-digit millis. And then we had a ton of stuff where it was higher than that, variable, you know, up to 100 milliseconds. Who cares? You know, like, I mean, not totally who cares. I mean, if you get into half a second or more, we definitely care, but a lot less stringent. But we had all this stuff and this breadth of things going down to even sub-milli, and we had to make it work. Otherwise, we were looking at a multi-year project and not something that we would be able to actually make the business thrive, let alone tackle uh, the new opportunities uh, that were coming our way. Third thing we knew is we had no idea. We had learned our lesson. We didn't know what was going to happen. Scale was going to be just part of the game. It could be 2x, 10x, 100x, who knows. And that meant from the data coming in upstream, and it meant potentially in the number of systems we put in play downstream. And so we had to make sure that the architecture we went with would actually work no matter where that led. So we ended up building this thing that internally we called Feedster Caster. And I'm going to initially just jump to the end. That's the picture. There's no way we go through all of that, uh, all of this in this talk. There's a bunch of components to it. We're going to, for the rest of this talk, just pull out the few pieces of this that I think are the most interesting, uh, certainly the, thing, the areas where we learned the most from and where there was potentially some of the most uh, fun, inno innovative things that we got, we got to play around with. High level, though, what's going on here is you've got a bunch of data coming in on, on, you see there's that little line in the middle. You can consider everything on this side of it to be the server side, the side of the things where you're managing the raw feeds from exchanges. And everything on the other side is effectively systems that are downstream. So you have this stuff, you know, multiple servers partitioning the world of what's coming in from the exchanges. Something called Feedster that we did write in C++ that is parsing that raw feed and then basically writing it down into a shared memory file. Then we had another thing that's sitting on that same server as the thing parsing the raw feeds that is written in C. And it is taking the data out of the shared memory file and just broadcasting it on the network. On the other side of the line there, you've got all your client systems. There's another little guy written in C that's listening to that broadcasted data set 
basically doing the inverse of what the sender is doing, taking it, throwing it into a shared memory. Then you have however many apps you might be running on one of those pieces of, of hardware uh, that's on the client side that's accessing this data, the internalized uh, market data, out of that shared memory store. And that's pretty much it. That's all there is to the overall sort of high-level view of what we, what we did. Now, the real trick was, how do you make it so that that transport mechanism from the server side, where it's taking out a shared memory, broadcasting it out, and then getting down to the client side, how do you make it so that it's reliable? Because again, we're, we're giving up on TCP. And so, we're, and, and so we're, the, the network protocol itself is not going to guarantee us that we see things in order, let alone see them at all, but we need it. We have, to, we have to make sure that the client side of things actually does see everything. And so we had to come up with a, a way to solve the problem. I'm going to have Justin join the conversation here because Justin pretty much developed most of this stuff. There was, he worked with a, a small group of other people um, o over the time we did this in particular. Uh, another guy named David, where they initially came up with the solution of how do you create this reliable multicast thing. And I've got a, a, you'll notice there's a bunch of names of various things on the screen. And, and what those are is a bunch of various third party open source, pay for, uh, some are just uh, protocol uh, implementations of getting data from one side to the other of a network where you are attempting to get reliability in place and multi with multicast as the underlying. Uh, delivery mechanism. So, Justin, walk, walk us through. If, why didn't we use one of those third-party? Thank things? you, Ron. Uh, so, we we did try these these ones out, and they kind of they're general-purpose libraries that solve the problem of if you want to multicast data across the network, you have given up the uh, reliability mechanisms that TCP gives you for, for free. So the way these systems work is that they essentially keep a copy of what has been sent over the network. And when somebody listening for that data indicates through what's called a negative acknowledgement, a NAC, that they didn't receive that data, the data is retransmitted to, uh, over the network to give the, give the client the, uh, an, another chance to, to, to read it. So, so we tried these, these uh, systems out because they were kind of a little bit like a drop-in replacement for just our networking code. They didn't require us to change an awful lot of the actual kind of application to, to use them. And unfortunately, the results were not really very satisfactory. And one of, one of the, the main issue that we had is that once the kind of uh, bandwidth of the incoming uh, exchange feeds increased and the network started to drop packets, um, the network would quickly become overloaded by the negative acknowledgements, by the NACs themselves. So in other words, the bandwidth would spike, and this would cause some packets to be dropped, whereupon the clients would request, please send me those packets that we dropped. They would then get sent on the network, but meanwhile, the, the incoming ex exchange feed still needs to be delivered over the same network. So you tend to just magnify exponentially, really, the amount of bandwidth you, you require just to sustain the same kind of data rates. Effectively, I mean, what you may have heard this if you've used anything like this, this is just a NAC storm. Yeah. You know, the tons of data coming in, things start dropping, all your clients start saying, hey, I need this, I didn't get this, and they're sending all these NACs back, upstream's resending more data as it's sending the other data coming in the door, and it just becomes this vicious cycle. Right. So that didn't work for us. That didn't work for us. And uh, we didn't feel really that, um, although the, 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 the general purpose libraries solved the reliability problem in the general case, we didn't really feel that they were taking advantage of what was special about the data we were sending over the network, which was that it's market data. And with market data, you're really just interested in the most recent message or the most recent values for, for something. You're not really interested if you've dropped some packets in reconstructing what, what was the case a few seconds ago or even a few milliseconds ago. You really just want to know what was the very latest piece of data you've received uh, for Apple stock or the price of a Google option. Right. So, so the one, one thing that is different is, is the, these solutions that you can use are very general purpose. Mm. They are, I'm going to try to give you reliable delivery of packets. I don't care what is in the packet. I'm just going to try to say overall mechanism. If you drop a packet, ask for it, and I'll give you that packet if I still have it, which, by the way, the, the upstream doesn't, can't hold infinite number of back, backlog of, of, of packets. That's right. So at some point, some client who's slow enough might say, hey, I missed this stuff. And the answer is, well, too bad. 
we don't have it, no reliability for you. And so, so one thing that I'm going to flip to the next slide on, which was really this aha moment, I would say, that, that Justin and, and the team working on it came to was, we don't have to solve world hunger. We don't have to solve the general purpose solution. We can solve something that's just for the problem at hand. Right. So, I mean, on, on, on the screen, you see a kind of a typical example of what's, of what's going on when there's a lot of incoming market data. And we've got three Apple quotes kind of on the wire, one, one behind the other, probably just you know, a few dozen microseconds apart. And the one that's in blue is the most recent one. And that's really the only one that we, we care about. The, we can see on the right of the screen, there's our kind of key value store that we're retaining the, the, the quotes, the latest quotes in, in the, in the client application. And the leading two Apple quotes in, in white, really, we, it would, be, would have been better if they'd never been sent. They're, they're really superseded entirely by the blue Apple quote. Because by the time the client application looks and says, what's the current quote for, for Apple? It really wants the latest one. It wants the, the blue one. And the, the two that preceded it are redundant. Right, so what did this change? Like, how did, how did you make use of this and what you did? So what that meant was for us that we, would, we kind of understood that if this, this is a peculiar aspect. This is a peculiar characteristic of the data we're sending. Is there some way that we can take advantage of this peculiarity and come up with a better protocol for sending the data and more importantly deciding when not to send the, the data? And the, 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 kind of the, the, the strange kind of thing is about market data is that when the market is moving very, very quickly and it's producing a lot of kind of quotes for a lot of different security uh, that's really the time you care about retransmissions the least because if the market is sending you a whole stream of quotes more and more quickly, the chances are that by the time you realize that you missed a quote just a few milliseconds ago or a few microseconds ago, there's going to be another quote that would have superseded it coming along anyway. So you really don't care about the retransmission at that point. It's really when things are moving very, very slowly that you might care about the retransmission because you then you've, you've, you've missed an event which is going to be long lasting in its significance. And so that's, that's the time you really care about the replay, but not when things are really, really right. maxing out. So how, did you what, how do you take advantage of that? How does it actually work where that makes it so that you don't have to retransmit everything? So the, so the way the system works is that um, the, the publisher of, of the quotes, in, in this case, uh, associates with each change in a quote that gets sent out a version number. And when the client application realizes that it's missed a packet, uh, it requests, essentially through TCP, a reliable channel, it requests to be resent the uh, packets that were missed, which contain version 27, version 28 of, say, the, the, of the Apple quote. And then the publisher can look at the version number, and meanwhile the publisher is still sending out more recent Apple quotes. It can look at the re request from a client that's saying, I missed something, and actually looking at the version number, say, well, I, you've requested version 27 of the Apple quote, but I've just multicast out version 29. So I'm not going to send you 27. I'm just going to quietly ignore your request because I know you're just going to receive version 29. If you don't receive version 29, then you'll re-request 29, and we'll, we'll, we'll start again considering what we need to do. But essentially, the, the publisher realizes that it can avoid uh, honoring retransmit requests because it knows it's already multicast the data that's superseded that, right. that request. So, so I mean, the, the, peculiar, the peculiarity of the data is really that it, yep. it has a key to it. And if you can version the data that you have on a key, your, your back channel is basically able to know, I already sen I've sent That's you right. a more recent one. You don't, I'm not, I'm not going to send this to you. That's right. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the beauty of the protocol is that the, the more you drop packets because the network is multicasting more and more data, the less retransmissions you actually need to recover from that drop. And so there's a kind of built-in dampening effect in the, in the protocol. When you, we, un, unlike with the general purpose libraries, the more you dropped, the harder it was to recover. With this, the more you drop, the easier it is to recover. Right. And again, it's because of the nature of the data. We knew the data 
and how it behaved and, we're to, and we were able to sort of at least in theory, and this is, you know, as we built it, it was all like theoretically this should be true, that we were able to take advantage of the fact that when the market goes crazy, that's when you get a lot of data and it goes crazy for a little while. And that's when you're likely to get most things, multiple quotes, you know, many, sometimes thousands, hundreds of thousands in, within a millisecond of the same thing over and over again. And so we were able to say, using this protocol, knowing that, when it gets bad, we're gonna, we're gonna back off and we're gonna make it so that we are less likely to actually handle any more traffic on the network than what was already coming in from the upstream, potentially even less. Whereas in the more general purpose solutions, you get these NAC storms and it actually ends up being more and more and more and you just kind of can't keep up. So that was really for us, uh, this aha moment. And I don't, I mean, for years we've been, we've worked with this data and built systems along this. And, and this had, I mean, a after we did it, we built it, we've both in testing as well as in reality, it's been out there for years now. This has played out to be quite true. When, when the market goes very, goes bonkers on us, this thing just hums along. And it hums along, not like suddenly you magically have not any bandwidth in use around your network, but it's not much higher than what would have, what the actual upstream that is coming from the exchanges is causing. So if you're getting five gigabits per second sustained or 10 gigabits per second sustained coming in from the upstream, that's more or less what you're gonna see within your internal network. And even if some things are dropping stuff, the likelihood, and then they're coming back and saying, hey, I dropped this, almost invariably, it doesn't matter because they already have another one that they didn't drop that, that means that they don't no longer need to, to get it. And, and for us, I mean, again, it seems obvious now, but it took us years to get to this generally simple solution that is now uh, working really well and scales pretty well. But so, so we get this protocol in place and it's great, excellent. We're able to actually get a bunch of data from the upstream stuff that's handling all the exchange data and push it out to all these machines and it's on multicast so we can scale those downstream and it's not gonna cause, uh, generally gonna cause uh, further issues with copying data and overloading our, our, our routers and whatnot. But we still had this big system where we had a bunch of stuff in Java. We had, frankly, a lot of stuff in Python. We started using more and more Go, which by the way, we used as part of building out components of this system as well. And, and we needed all of those things to be able to interact with this data that we were now storing in shared memory. Um, oh, and also we wanted our stuff to be able to continue to optimize the hardware we had in place. So, and by, by that, that would mean that, that we wouldn't have to end up having, uh, if you've got five apps running on a piece of hardware because the apps themselves are not doing a ton, they wouldn't each need their own version of getting this data sent to them. And so that was a problem that we had to solve and, and we had to do it in a way that would some, you know, somehow make it relatively easy for all these apps to integrate with this. So, uh, you know, Justin, I'll let you kind of talk to what do we do right. and how do we solve it? So, so having kind of solved the redundant copying problem on the network, we didn't really want to reproduce a, a bunch of redundant copies on the client machines where we've got multiple applications in different languages, as you say, trying to access this data. So the obvious solution is, is twofold. How can we avoid redundant copying, uh, which would be the case, for instance, if these guys were opening a, a socket or a connection to some service on the machine and requesting data. So, uh, we avoid that problem by um, using shared memory. So we store one copy of the incoming data in a file which we memory map. And that makes the data available to every process that requires it without having to reproduce multiple copies of it. The other advantage of that is that providing a data in uh, a memory at an address, it's more or less easy in any language that we, we use to access that data. It, it, there are some languages where it's trivially easy to do that. There's some languages where you perhaps need to wrap that access in a library because they don't uh, uh, expose raw memory to in their programming model. So does uh, that mean that then each of these languages you have to write your own custom version of going and looking at that memory? And so the we, 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 we thought about how we can provide a uniform one single way of making it available and there's, there's kind of a, an obvious universal uh, uh, solution to that which is to provide a C library that accesses the shared memory and the C library, uh, the, the beauty of a C library is that pretty much every language on the planet 
allows access to the facilities provided by a C library in one form or another. You can import a C library into Python pretty easily, obviously very easily into C++, very easily into Go, and, and quite easily into, into Java. It may be a little bit more work in this language or that, but it's all very doable. It's, it's a well-understood programming model. And uh, the C library also has the advantage that it can hide the messy details of opening a memory map file and setting up that kind of like mapping yeah. and make it a, a kind of a much more comfortable interface to accessing this data for, for people who are in these different languages. Right, so there you go. We found a use for C, <laughs> um, which by the way, if you haven't caught on, it is, it is Justin's preferred language. Um, and it, it's, found a, it's found a good home in, 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 at Peak 6 right now. So great. So we have a C library. We can open up this stuff. We can interact with it through that library. You don't have to redo everything in all these languages. But let's talk about Java. So obviously, I mean, if, if we've got people who are writing Java out there, certainly who, if you haven't uh, done much or any off-heap stuff, the first question maybe is, well, well wait a minute. How, how am I going to access this shared memory stuff from Java, like that doesn't, uh, it's not something that's naturally offered up to the API, it's, it kind of falls out of that, uh, that realm of write once, run everywhere. And so that was the first thing, which is, what do you do with memory map files? And m since Mike did all of this, sort of single-handedly, I'm gonna let him walk through what, what, all the problems and what he had to do. Sure, yeah, thanks Ryan. Uh, so yeah, I mean, just to take a minute, like, just to uh, kind of talk about memory map files a little bit. Like, I mean, really, you know, memory map files you can think of as just like a block of virtual memory that, you know, like you can map in your process and then interact with directly. Um, you know, like, and it's, it's gonna be backed by something else, like a, like a file or just shared memory in this instance. So, you know, like it's, it's gonna get used often in places where either you need shared memory, you need to share memory between two different processes, um, or, um, you know, like in, in like places where you just have a lot of high I.O and uh, you want to make that performant. Um, and so like really, yeah, we needed to, to be able to interact you know, like with this shared memory. Uh, we were able to use uh, uh, Justin's C library uh, in order to kind of handle that for us, um, you know, like in a, a, you know, like in a way that where we didn't have to re-implement it. Uh, there's definitely ways of you know, like doing that you know, like in Java, like mapping in the memory, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not something that's really uh, standard you know, like across platforms and stuff like that. So it, um, you know, like we, were, we were able to take advantage of uh, of that library in order to open up the file and kind of in, in, interrogate it, investigate it. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, we didn't exactly want to use that, uh, that library to have to read every single record or every single field uh, out, of the, uh, out of the shared memory. Um, and so the, and the main reason is, is that, you know, like, so we're, we're using this library, right, you know, like the C library, but you know, like we're, we're really trying to use JNI, or, or in our case, like really JNA, uh, to interact with that, that file, you know, like the, to be able to call functions that know where the records are and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, like really there's, there's some, uh, some performance, you know, like overhead that you're gonna get, you know, like with going through that library, you know, like with using JNI or, you know, like even worse with, you know, like through JNA, um, you know, like, and so, you know, there's really, there's not, not really a, a need, you know, like to do that. You know, once you kind of know where it is, you know, like where the memory is that you really wanna start interacting with, then you know, like you don't you don't have to go through the library in order to do this kind of raw stuff to be able to read uh, this off heap memory, you know, like the, where the records are actually being stored, right? So what do you what do you do? How do you access it? Yeah, so so the answer is really using unsafe. Uh, so if you hadn't heard of unsafe or haven't seen it, like uh, unsafe is is you know like the this library that uh, you know like really class that this part you know like uh, that this part of of Java where. Uh, it's not, uh, it's called unsafe for a reason. It's not, not really meant, you know, to be used or wasn't originally meant to be used by, um, you know, like developers like us that are just making applications. It's, it's really meant to be used internally, you know. Uh, and so it's unsafe in that, you know, like it, uh, its API itself can change and actually is changing, uh, you know, like in Java 9. And so, you know, like you're going to have to, um, you know, like redo a bunch of your code if you code too much to the, to the API itself. Uh, and then secondly, like, you know, it's, it's unsafe because uh, in Java, like, you know, we are, you know, like you uh, create objects, you throw them around, like you don't, you don't worry about, um, you know, like things like seg faults, right? But uh, you, can, you can easily get one if, you know, like if you're going through unsafe and, and using it directly. Um, so, you know, like it's, it's you know, like it, you gotta be careful about it. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, you know, like using unsafe is a way that, you know, like without even using, you know, like anything external to Java, we're going to be able to uh, interact with these, these shared memory files uh, in a way that's, that's high performance. All right, so what, why don't you walk us through an example here? 
Sure. Show us exactly what it is. Okay. So, you know, like, so that we got this, like, little class uh, quote, you know, like, and uh, it's only got a few fields in it. Um, you know, like, typically, in, you know, like, systems, like, you'd, you just kind of create one of these objects, you'd populate it, you know, like, and then toss it around. Uh, but, you know, like, the place that you populate it from would typically be from some other on heap uh, memory source, um, some on heap store. Uh, so, you know, like, here, you know, like, we just have these few fields, like, you know, basically, um, you know, like you can, uh, you, we just have these bid and ask, you know, like fields here for the, these records, like, um, you know, like, you know, like you're, these really just represent like basic properties, you know, like of, uh, of market data. Uh, and we just, we just want to be able to take these objects, read the data from off store and or from off heap and then uh, use them on heap, right? Um, so, you know, like here's an example of us using unsafe uh, in order to, uh, to do that. So, uh, we we kind of come in here, you know, like we, we know what record ID that we want to read, right? Uh, and so what we have to do is just compute the address, you know, like that we're going to start reading from, right? So we, we see that records at right there, like that's that's really something that we're only going to know by um, you know like by reading the uh, location out of the uh, you know like using the library, right? Like we have to know where the record array or you know like records uh, themselves start. So we have to get that out of the store using the library. We know what the record ID is that we want to use, uh, but then we have to, you know, kind of compute the address just using the record size as well uh, that we that also came from the library. So we get an address of this record that we want to start reading. You know, like we create one of these quotes. Um, you know, we we create the you know like the uh, the byte array to store the the uh, the bytes representing the Apple symbol, right? Uh, we copy that from off uh, off heap onto the heap, uh, and then we. Uh, we create this string object to, to, you know, like hold those bytes, um, and we read the bid, we read the ask, you know, like we read the exchange, right? So, we, you know, like these are, these are, uh, every time that we're calling unsafe here, uh, then it's reading something that's out of that uh, shared memory store, uh, and then putting it into an object that's on the heap. So, but wait, I thought, a, I mean, a big part of this is managing memory off the heap so that you're not creating a bunch of GC, but your solution basically is generating a bunch of garbage, right? Yeah, that's right. No, so uh, we, uh, you know, like, you know, like that's a really good point. So, you know, like, you know, th this is just as bad, right? Like, where we're still creating that quote object, we're still creating that byte array, right? Like, we, we, we don't really want to do that because, you know, like, we, we build up enough objects and we're just going to get GC that's going to just introduce more pauses, right? So, like, we, we, we want to stay away from that. So here, you know, like, what, what we can do is just pass in that quote object. Uh, we can we can get it, you know, like from the the guy that's that's calling it. Maybe he's reusing one, you know, like maybe so like a pool a, of them or something. Yeah, yeah, it could be in a pool, you know, like or even it could just be one that's that's really in a sense bound to the thread that's calling, you know, like or if we know that we're in a single threaded context, we can take advantage of that. Um, lots of ways where you can like just you know like kind of keep one existing object around that you're going to reuse over and over. Right? Okay. Uh, so we're going to just pass that object in uh, and then just set the fields on that instead of creating a new one, right? So, still some news there, though. Yeah, so, so you know, like, we, we still got that byte array and we still got that string. So, you know, like, how are we going to solve that? So, uh, you know, like, here we can pass in that, that quote object and we can um, ch change, instead of having just a string field, you know, inside that object, we're going to have to make it a byte array in essence. And it's like, you know, like, that, that's going to allow us to just read it into that pre existing array. Okay, so then we're still just, we're not creating that extra garbage here anymore. Uh, we're able to take advantage of that. The, you know, like the, the thing that this, this might look bad in a sense because like you're thinking like, oh yeah, everybody that's calling this then is going to have to interpret, you know, like this is like bytes or this is going to have to create a string to, to really know that that's Apple. Um, but in reality, like if you kind of think about it, uh, this is really the key of the record, right? The guy that's, that's calling this and asking for this record, he's asking for this record for a reason, right? Like he knows that this is Apple and he can probably, if you, you know, like he, if, since he knows that it's Apple, he he probably already has a string around that says Apple in it that he can then uh, tack on to the object after we kind of read it out of memory. So, you know, like this, this actually, you know, like it, it's, strings are notoriously hard, right? You know, like when you're trying to, cons you know, like conserve your allocations, but, um, you know, like doing, doing stuff like this will help where, you know, like it, it's, it's okay to and kind of use it for keys and in context where you know what the data is because you can then go and reuse those strings. Right. All right, I mean, it, while somewhat complicated, it obviously seems relatively simple. So, 
I mean, why not done quickly? I mean, you should have been just able to replace everything. And if I recall right, this took a while. Yeah, that, uh, this, this did take a while. Uh, yeah, so I mean, really, you know, like there's all these little problems that kind of start to pop up when you, you know, you know, like just, I mean, change the system for one, but then really start to use more of this different approach. So like, you know, like with these files, we have to know, you know, like what each record represents. You know, like we have to be able to watch for new records that are added after we start, right? You know, like we have to be able to interact with that C library and we have to know that, you know, like, okay, if the uh, subscriber in our box, you know, shuts down and then downloads a new one that he's gonna he's gonna create a new shared memory store. There's there's just all these different problems that just started popping up that you know like are all solvable problems, but nonetheless they they, they do you know take some work to, to solve. Okay, so that actually seems like it's relatively complicated to try to achieve this. Like how how much of our I mean how often do you have to go through all this nonsense just so that you can use Java and not have a GCing like crazy with this amount of data. Yeah, I mean, not not as much as you would, you would think. Like, so I mean, really, this is the ten percent of our code that that you know, like, we really need to, to kind of optimize around and like uh, and and to, to kind of make very very quick, uh, very fast, right? But I mean, like the the rest of our code, like you know, like the ninety percent of it is you know just you know like it's not it's not written to you know you know like avoid allocations this this uh, intensely and all that kind of stuff. So you know, like you you really gotta you know think about the the ninety ten rule and kind of you know be able to. Um, and when needed, you know, like apply this stuff. Okay. Um, but, uh, but not all the time. So as you can see, there's a bunch, there really was a bunch of issues that came up as we went. Some we anticipated, some that literally just came up along the way. Um, there's no way we can go through all of them, but many of them are pretty interesting. We, there's two we're going to pull out that are at least interesting to look at. So the first one would be this one that's like how to lock without locking, which First, what, what what in the world does that mean, and why do why was this a problem? Yeah, I mean, you know, like so really, you know, like this isn't exactly locking, right? Like uh, this is more just, you know, like we we want to read an actual like legit value from the store, right? So you know, like we we're not really we're not really able to lock in the traditional sense because we we don't want to slow down or kind of create this contention between different processes here. Remember, we're we're sharing this memory, you know, like we're not just talking about locking inside the JVM or anything like that. We're we're talking about you know like potential you know, like uh, by doing any real locking solution, blocking other processes. Right. So, so there's this thing that that Justin wrote that's writing how much data per right. second. Right. So so there's there's hundreds of thousands of records being updated every second, and there's in in each file, and there's a, there's a lot of these different files, and there's one uh, Unix process which is writing to the file, and then there's a bunch of different processes, application programs on the machine looking at that same memory, right. and they need to kind of uh, be able to read that memory in uh, in a in a correct way not read garbage out of it because they read a partial update and yet they can't really lock the record because they may be written in something that's running quite slowly or they may be doing some long update or something like that it's going to block right. the whole thing so like kind of some delivery. python thing could be written that you that needs to look at this data that for whatever reason it was written in a way where it locks the the writer out goes and hits a database comes mm -hmm. back some time later and then says, oh yeah, that's that quote I wanted, and, and all of a sudden everything's right. falling over. Yeah. So can't do that. So we need to see data correctly, but not lock. So this is really about avoiding reading partial right. data, right? Partially written data. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely right. Like, so, I mean, you know, like, we're going to go through this example really quick. Like, so, say that we've, we've got this, this Apple uh, quote, you know, like, first we write out, you know, like, oh, it's 106 and 5 cents, and then, you know, like, the ask is 106 at 10 cents, right? Then, you know, like, a new quote comes along, and we're, now we're, the bid is changed to 106.15, and the ask is changed to 106.20. So, you know, like, when the reader, if, with, without really doing anything, if we don't try to prevent it, then, you know, like, we can get to a situation where this happens, where we, re we read that the bid is 106 and 15 cents, and the ask is 106 and 10 cents. When real, in reality, like that never really happened. You know, like that, that that's not really a true record. Um, so you know, like what we're going to do is this. You know, like we're we're really going to try to lock just using the version of the data. Okay. So the so the writer is is you know every time that, that he's writing on record, he's effectively incrementing this version that's attached to each record. But he doesn't just increment. It, okay. So he really does three things. He he locks it, meaning that he negates the version of the record. Okay. He he writes a negative number there. You know. Then he writes the full record value. And then he unlocks it. He unlocks it by negating that number and then adding one. Okay, so effectively we, we incremented it, but we had to go through you know, these three steps to get there. The reader, on the other hand, he's gonna wait until he sees a positive version, you know, like in that record. He's gonna read the version number, then he's gonna read the full record value, and then read that version again. All right, and he's gonna repeat if the versions are different. 
Um, so as an example of this, like, you know, like see that we see that same first quote, okay, we have 106 at, uh, and five cents for the bid and 106 at 10 cents at the, for the ask. Right, so the writer, he's gonna, you know, like it's starting out as version 101, he's gonna write negative 101, then he's gonna write the new quote out, okay, so the new uh, record value, and then write the version 102, okay? Uh, the reader, on the other hand, like he's, he's gonna read the, 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 the initial version, 101 there, he's gonna read some mixed uh, record, you know, like a, a record with the new bid but the old ask, all right? Then he's gonna see, oh, okay, there's this negative version, negative 101. That means that I have to kind of keep going because negative 101 and 101, the, the version that he first read are different, right? So I have to, I have to repeat. So he, maybe he reads in, uh, the version again, it's still negative. Now he reads it and it's 102, all right? And so now he can read that full record value and you know, he can read the version again and hey, they're the same. That means that we've got a consistent read and we can use that value. So another thing we had to deal with is, right, there's a C library that we're dealing with and it does a bunch of stuff on us and, and we don't control what's on the other side of this as well. And it, it, in both the interaction with that C library live as well as just in you know, general development became problematic, right? Like, I mean, talk about some pain points we had here. Yeah, so, I mean, really, this isn't a highly concurrent system, right? So like, you know, when things go wrong or like during startup or whatever, like, you know, there's definitely times where that, that block of memory, those, or one of those blocks of memory that we're, we're reading from, uh, you know, like we all of a sudden, you know, like need to switch to using a new block of memory for that same, uh, that same data. So that means that... So, so just to give like the why, let's say the other side crashed or something changed and it has to be restarted or moved. What's going to end up happening is it's going to, you, you've got this thing, this ecosystem on the other side that's going to be saying, oh, I'm done with that file. I'm, I'm closing it, reopening and putting a new file in place. And you might have this other app sitting there trying to access it at the same time because they're dis disconnected. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we really we need to be able to kind of uh, switch these two things out. And everybody that's reading from this stuff within the process needs to kind of all at once be able to start looking at the new block of memory and try not to seg fault in the process. Okay. So, you know, like, and then the other thing is just, like, we're, we're using Java that's right once we're in anywhere and everything, right? Like, it's, it's supposed to be easy to just, you know, like, compile and then start running everywhere. Like, C is not like that, you know? And so now we're kind of, we're trying to make sure that we're building with the, the, the right version of the library, the one that, that, that matches what we want to do stuff with. And so you know, we had to kind of write some, some custom build stuff just to be able to, to, give, to build this C stuff, you know, like, as we're building our Java stuff and ship it along with it. Right, just silly practicalities, but, like, yeah. Justin sitting there furiously <laughs> writing this API, being like, oh, we need this, or we have to change that, and you're furiously trying to use it. And yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the the, uh, the the tooling for just debugging and stuff was just as bad. Like just trying to you know like call into the Zebra library and, and getting safe faults there, and then figuring out like where did it go wrong. Like that, I mean you know like that there are, are, are funky ways of doing it, but you know like it's 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 difficult. It's not it's not easy. right because you're looking at the core from your JVM. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So definitely pain points, and and like I said, there's a whole laundry list of things. But if you work through them, and especially if you contain the area of your program that you're dealing with these problems, um, you can achieve uh, very high performance systems um, and controllable amounts, even at high data rates and, 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 and uh, a, a great amount of activity going on within your VM, you can still control the amount of garbage getting created. And so when all's said and done, we did do this and we managed to keep it relatively controlled we went from crisis to maybe smooth sailing is going a little bit far, but it worked. It worked. We did not have to, our three issues were more or less solved. Our network was no longer being completely destroyed by uh, the, both the markets as well as our um, sort of abuse of them internally by using TCP to get all this big data around. We had uh, all this stuff that we'd build in Java that we got to keep. We had to change some of the core elements of how it interacted with market data, some other stuff along the way that we learned was a result of, of even doing this work that we said, hey, that'd be smart to, do, to you know, use these same techniques, techniques in other places as well, and we got a better system as a result. And we didn't really cover this exactly in detail, but this thing scales extremely well. If the upstream side keeps growing, if there's 10 more exchanges next year, if they all triple the amount of data they're pushing, we can scale this out really easily. We're not gonna have to write a line of code to be able to have it scale. 
And again, because of the way that we've managed and segmented the data on the downstream, that's going to be also true um, from that perspective. So our, the three things we went in knowing we need to solve, by doing this, we, we really got to a good solution. And, and we ended up having a system that more or less is able to do all these things. And here are some of the things we learned as well. Like 10 gigabits per second, while it doesn't happen all day every day, some days it happens and it can happen for an uncomfortable long amount of time where you're getting that much data from all the markets and you have to just keep up with it. And in fact, when that happens, it's the worst moment for your business if your stuff doesn't keep up or, or is, not, is starting to drop data. And it's the highest opportunity for you if you build stuff that actually can keep up with it. There usually are not 30 million messages per second, but it does happen. And, and that's what the 10, 10 gigs of data can break down into. And you have to be able to not just say, here's the bandwidth, I've got it, but also parse it and do something with it. Um, and from a low latency perspective, you know, you, we had systems that are built in Java where we have to have either sub, sub milli, uh, consistent sub milli management or single digit milli, and, and it worked. We, we also did a bunch of other things along the way. We used Go for parts of this. We didn't go into it in this, but we were really finding that it's a lovely little language, and there's a bunch of things about their philosophy on, on keeping things simple that works, and we, everything we've tried to do with it has, has ended up being pretty fast, pretty maintainable, and definitely a more on the fun side of things to, to, to work with. Um, as we said earlier, C is still there. C is still fun. Mm. C++ is still around. We did not fully get rid of it. Um, I, I, you know, there's definitely a little bit of a love-hate uh, amongst people in, 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 at Peak 6 around where we have C++ in use, but it has a home. Um, and more or less, the way we built this, it, it, it achieved goals across optimizing hardware and working across all these languages. And that is pretty much it. Yeah, oh, thank, thank you. you.